Welcome specialists, coaches, dads of kickers, moms of punters, relatives of long snappers, and dogs that shag kickoffs to the Iceman Kicking Podcast. It's the show with cold questions and even cooler guests. And we are here to talk about the ins and outs of special teams and specialists. I am your host, Brett Arkelian. Um, very excited about the guest we have today, Special Team U founder, Kyle Stetler. Did I say that right, St- Stetler? Go ahead. Yeah, Stelter. Yeah. Stelter, my bad. Kyle Stelter, very excited to have you on here. Kyle, how are you feeling today? I'm good, man. I'm excited to be here too. Always, always exciting to talk about long snapping. Yes, and that was something we were talking about earlier, is that uh, long snapping is kind of the forgotten one when it comes to specialists. You know, everyone wants to talk about a game-winning field goal, uh, but no one wants to talk about the awesome snap of the laces out. So I think it's very important for us to highlight snapping and have someone who knows about the craft come on and talk about it. Absolutely. And and everything, uh, you know, with with long snapping, it's something where I always tell my guys, just be as humble as possible, fly under the radar. You know, other people will talk for you. If If you're good, you'll talk about yourself. If you're great, other people will talk about you, you know, for you. So um, I think that's something to remember, and especially as a long snapper, where that's our job is just to do your job, be good at it, um, and be perfect every single time. Sure, and remain unnoticed. That's Absolutely, the big, the big thing. This show is brought to you by the Kicker's Bible. The Kicker's Bible. Do you want to learn the ins and outs of kicking from NFL specialists? Organize practice schedules for in season and the off season so you don't overkick. How to get a full ride scholarship offer the perfect long snapping technique for tossing a 6-5 ball on the hip every time. This book provides specialists with the ultimate guide containing everything necessary to find success as a specialist at the highest level. Brett Arkelling combined over 10 years of experience as a player and coach with countless hours of research to develop this handbook of the greatest collection of proven technique tips used by college and NFL specialists and coaches all in one place. The Kicker's Bible is a must-have for both players and coaches at every level who want access to information essential to perform and teach at the best of their ability. Go to IcemanKicking.com to get your copy today. Hey, a little bit about Kyle before we get into things, all right? He coaches long snappers at every level, um, and specifically, a couple NFL long snappers train with him. James Fisher with the Lions, Jacob Bob, Bob and Moyer with the Broncos, uh, Luke Rhodes with the Colts, and Ross Mattis, Mattis with the Jaguars. Am I missing anyone, Kyle? Uh, Austin Cutting with the Vikings. Austin Zach Cutting. Triner with the Buccaneers. Um, James was recently let go from the Lions. but So right now we have five. We have Jacob, Austin, Luke. Zach and Ross are all the starting long snappers right now for those teams. Yeah, and I figured too, I mean, what, yesterday or this weekend were the cuts, so I figured there'd be some changes going forward. And I know with the expanded practice uh, squad now, I mean, that might may leave a better opportunity for specialists to stay with an NFL team. Yeah, so right now I know there was three long snappers signed to practice squads, and we're hoping for a couple more. Uh, but every team's going to use those spots differently and uh, new rules, new, new spots, but we'll see what happens. No doubt. No doubt. Hey, before we get into anything too deep, let me get a word from our sponsor in here. All right. We do have Kyle here on here. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this. I know you started out as an offensive lineman back in the day in high school. Yeah, so in, in high school, I was an offensive lineman. I played guard, I played center, um, and my coaches really wanted me to learn how to snap, and it's something I did for the team. Um, and actually, kind of funny story, in high school, I was snapping on field goals one day, and I had no clue what I was doing. I was pretty good at it, but it was super stressful. It was hit or miss whether I was going to have a bad, good or bad snap. So I purposefully messed up, so I got pulled on field goal. and didn't have to do it again because I hated it. I hated snapping, and I think it all stemmed out to – I didn't know what I was doing. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be very confident in something. So I got pulled. I got to play guard on field goal. We got to mess with jumpers. So it was great. Um, Going into college, I think my coaches knew that, hey, you're a little small to be playing offensive line somewhere. 
why don't you work on your snapping? So my high school coach kind of helped me out with it, got a little bit better. And I went to a division three school um, right down the road and made the team as a long snapper and linebacker. Um, not really a linebacker. I don't think, you know, that was even what the coaches saw me playing, but hey, it was something else to help the team. Um, ended up finally becoming a pure long snapper only my senior year of college. Um, started my junior year at, at long snapper, senior year, tried to play a little DN, and they're like, yeah, you should probably just snap. You're good at it. We'll keep you there. Nobody will get you hurt. Um, so I, I was just a pure snapper my senior year, which is super weird. And I know a lot of kids struggle with that when they first come into it, you know, get to the college level and they're only a snapper. Like, what do we do with all our free time? Um, it's super strange, but uh, if you know what you're doing, you know what you need to work on, it, it becomes a little bit easier. So after that, you know, I was actually just talking to one of my free agent clients today, like at a certain point in your life, like that feeling of wanting to be a part of a team and wanting to be in football just Sometimes it doesn't go away. So after I was done with college, I was like, I don't want to be done. What can I do? Um, played a little bit of semi-pro, um, won a national championship, won a couple uh, conference championships with that team, which is kind of cool. Not really a big deal. It's kind of just old guys that don't want to give it up. But it was also an opportunity for me to build film and still play. So during that time, I was also going to the Houston Pro Camp. And I uh, my first time out, was like 15th rated out of everybody, but there was guys like, they were wearing their Raven shorts and their Jet shorts. And like, I saw them on YouTube and I was like a little starstruck. Um, and I went there, got some experience. And the next time I went out, um, I got rated the number one snapper of, out of everybody. And I was like, wow, I think I might be okay at this. Um, that led to me being able to go and play for the Sacramento Mountain Lions. Did really well at their tryout out of, uh, 300 guys in an open trial they only kept one so that was pretty cool so I was the only the lone free agent I guess everybody else you know had agents calling guys in and uh, getting placed and grabbed and picked up from other areas and then that season was short we had about four games of my professional career uh, but still a really cool experience got to meet a lot of really cool guys actually my punter um was Spencer Lanning. He is famously known for getting uh, hurdled and kicked in the face by Antonio Brown. So that kind of cool, kind of crappy. He was really, he had a really good sense of humor about it. Uh, but when it happened, I was like, I know that guy. That's really cool. Uh, but after that, I kept training and uh, eventually got a workout with the New York Jets, um, beat out a couple of Division One snappers. And, you know, coming from a Division Three school, I thought that was so cool. Uh, and then got brought back in for rookie minicamp where I got a, a chance to compete. And at the end of the day, they stuck with their veteran, which, you know, you see all the time. But, you know, after that, lost a little bit of weight, kind of giving myself a break. And I was like, you know what? I just, I don't want to put that much weight back on. So I'll stick to coaching. But had a, a pretty solid playing background. How, uh, how much weight did you lose? Because it sounds like you lost a ton of weight. Yeah. So when I was in college, I was probably about 200, maybe 215 max. Um, and when I asked an NFL scout, like, hey, what do I got to be at to play in the NFL? He said, 250. And I was like, oh, 250, huh? Um, well, I'm probably going to get a call tomorrow, so let's get there now. So I was eating and lifting, and um, I thought I was just super jacked at the time. Like, I thought I was strong. And I did. I was stronger than I'd ever been, but I was also kind of fat. So I had done it the wrong way. Um, and so after I had left with the Jets, or, or got cut by the Jets, I guess, I got down to about 225 and I was like, I don't want to get back up to 230, 240. Uh, right now I, I'm about 200 pounds. So it's a, a big difference from where I was. And it just feels better not to be heavy. <laughs> no doubt. hundred percent. I know you hear that a lot too, with snappers too, as far as measurements, like you have to be this, you have to be that. And we'll hit on that a little mm -hmm. bit later, but I want to go back to something you said earlier uh, about the pressure of a situation. I've seen this, in different phases uh, for me personally as a player and a coach that you know you didn't want to snap uh, because of the pressure of that situation what did you do throughout your career to you know block that pressure out yeah so I think it all comes back to knowing what you're doing I didn't want to do it because I had no clue like how do I move how do I finish it, my whole playing career all, I was just starved for how how do I do it can you help me? Can you just explain it to me? And nobody was, nobody was able to. They said, get your butt down, follow through. And I'm like, okay. So 
if you if you do that sure it'll work it'll help a little bit but that's one thing i've really kind of like just hooked on and it was like you know what not you know you can explain something simply but if you really dig into the details that's what a lot of guys need it's like tell me exactly what you mean like when i had a post about this the other day but so many of my guys they go to you know they get to college and their coach just says hey man you got to follow through so i said hey when somebody tells you to follow through what do they mean ask them did you not flick your wrists all the way through did your hands fly apart did they crisscross or did they go up and down did you not get your core all the way through did your legs not extend the right way did you not keep like so you can see there's a lot of little things that go into it when someone says follow through which little piece did they talk about or what did they mean uh, so there's there's all the little details that go into it and i think that's what a lot of guys lack so going back to the pressure thing if you if you start to understand how you do something exactly what you got to do and kind of complicate it in a way if the more you can complicate it and understand every little piece the easier it is to simplify it and if you're able to simplify it it's easier to just like ignore something so i think so many coaches are so eager to be like just do some breathing techniques you know just get out there and take a deep breath and just do it just do it you just got to do it man just go and do it like there's only so many times you can just be told hey man you just got to do it before you're like do what what do you what exactly are you asking me to do so it, it really changes your perspective once you're able to understand a little bit more of that so when i'm working with a snapper on pressure and we really i never like yell at them or player music because like that's the other side of it that's just like that's game mode you know just go do what you, you're trained to do but we break things down and make them feel different things we exaggerate movements we focus on small targets because if i can make them comfortable and confident in a situation where i'm trying to have them hit a tennis ball off a tee and they can do it consistently because of what they're doing with their body not because they're just trying to hit that object it makes a big difference in their ability to transfer that into a game mode and that's really cool you're you're preaching to the choir for sure with that because so many times for me as a specialist i've either seen that or been told that you know like you just got to get it done right and you're you're exactly right you're asking yourself what, what how do i get it done what it, what do i have to get done you know like how do i make this kick then you know if it's that simple keep and, your head down. yeah keep your head right, down, right? and follow yeah. through that's the biggest oh man that just hearing that you know makes me cringe a little bit but that's the biggest thing uh you know too when i, I was playing is like people will try to over oversimplify and i've done things in the past where i you know not making things more complicated for them in the moment or in the game but yep. you know at practice let's try to you know break things down just as you said and people will be very against that you know mm -hmm. it's supposed to be simple keep it simple no thinking for your specialist and it's like yeah well then how are you going to progress and get any better um i just think it's super funny that you know you went from not even wanting to be a snapper to that is your you know livelihood and that's what yeah that's what you're surrounded by i know right like it's super crazy i love to tell that story because like i have a lot of guys especially when they're going through this process like they're new to me and i'm like hey it's gonna suck you're at you're at a certain level you're gonna suck for a little bit because we're relearning it you're thinking about it you're thinking about everything you're relearning something new and it's not going to be comfortable so if you just trust that process and you you push through that you know you got to know like you're probably gonna quit you know like I, I tell guys like when i was playing and i was pursuing the nfl like every day i would go and i would just be like i suck at this i should quit and because i couldn't hit a chapstick off a foam roller you know i was like man i suck and then i go to a pro camp and i'd be on the money i'm like oh okay i guess i'm okay right so it's it's a process and i think if you just you trust it you just keep going through that grind it, it makes a big difference but so many guys are so results driven that if they don't have a pretty snap or a pretty kick like right now now i'm just going to revert to what i was doing screw going after you know making those changes um so every once in a while i'll have a kid that they're like they're like oh yeah no for sure i want to do this and then they have one ugly snap going through a new drill and they're like nah, they back off so i'm like come on man come back in trust it i promise it'll be better how do you how do you get guys back into that or hesitate because to me that's a little bit uh you know mental toughness and, and how oh, sure. how you handle failure how do you get guys to come back in and, and 
retrust the process? A lot of it's just kind of using uh, social stories about like, hey, here's Luke Rhodes. When he was in here last time, he was pissed off because I was making him do something different. His snap got a little bit ugly and he's like, why are we doing this? We had to talk about it. And at the end of the day, he saw the difference and he was like, okay, I get this now. It, it makes sense. So once you get past that, that point of resistance and you see a flash of what it could be, that's when you get that back. So I think using my NFL guys, like they all have been through that. None of them are where they're at because they're just a great athlete or they just, they're good at what they do or they have natural talent. They've all struggled. They've all changed. Um, and it's, it's been a process. So I think using those guys uh, to explain these, these younger guys, like, hey, man, you're not the only one. Everybody goes through that. I tell them the stories about myself. I tell them the stories about all these NFL guys or my college guys that go through the same thing. Um, and it works for most of the time. I think sometimes guys still are like, hey, you know what? But if I just do it this way, I can get the ball back there. And then I, I, I like to explain the difference between, between being effective and being efficient. There's a lot of very effective long snappers, okay? That doesn't really wow anybody. If you want to be efficient, you want to be like, damn, that was a really good ball. And you like, you pop some eyeballs every once in a while, you know? That's what, we'll be, that's what we're looking for. That's what efficiency brings. It brings though that result, but it also brings the effortless feeling of, of doing things in a different way, but a, a more efficient and cleaner, more controlled way. Effective versus efficient. I really like that, man. That's some, that's some good stuff right there. Uh, you know, and we talked about this briefly before too, but I, I want you to talk about why you think, why is it important to have someone who knows about long snapping or why is it important to be interested in long snappers? I mean, they're just one player. They're a small part of special teams. Can you tell me why that's important? Well, I mean, as a kicker, you know, you, you absolutely know the difference between having a good snapper and a bad snapper. And I think coaches understand that in general. Like, if I don't have a great snapper, maybe I miss more kicks. And that's a huge part of the game. Like, a lot of games are won by a couple points from your kicker, right? And if you have a, a snapper that's confident and comfortable and he, he's efficient, you're never going to have to worry about him, right? But if you have a guy that you're like, yeah, you know what, the snapper would just get it back there you're going to be nervous every time those guys go on the field. So as a coach, wouldn't you want to just be able to chill and just watch your guys go out there and kill it every time? Or do you want to be worried? I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's a thrill factor for some coaches and that's why they don't care, but it's extremely important. I mean, uh, it, it's important to give them time. It's important to have them work on what they're working on. And I think we talked about this a little bit earlier too. Like some coaches want to have the control and tell them what they want them to do. And some coaches are open to allowing them to work with, guys like myself, um, because they know that, hey, this is who's been teaching them, how they've gotten this far. Let's just trust that process and, and go with it uh, without interjecting too much because sometimes it clashes, you know. But I think overall, the good coaches know the importance. And I think, I think we talked about this earlier too. Like coaches grow. You learn. You, you learn from experience. You learn from mistakes. Coaches will grow right? They have a bad snapper or bad experience. They're going to want to learn more about snapping. They're going to want to get better so they can help their guy. And that's something I see a lot. Guys, the coaches that come to me and ask for assistance don't have a really good snapper. They have, they had a bad experience. They're like, Hey, my guy wasn't very good. How can I help him? So I think not that that's a great thing that they had bad experiences, but it's bringing them to the position and helping them become better. Well, and I think, too, if you have a younger specialist, so if you have a younger kicker, a younger punter, um, you know, he really needs a good ball every time. You know, he needs a good snap and hold every time. And if not, he might not have that mental toughness and might freak out, hit a bad ball. So it's all related, you know, and I, you know, I couldn't agree more with all the stuff you're saying there. Um, talk to me a little bit about, we're going to get more into the technique here now, what what to you is the most three important phases of a snap or what do you focus on, you know, when you're watching film with your guys? You know, I really love that you narrowed it down to three because there's literally three things that I look for. Um, so what they are, I look for balance, efficiency, and control. So those, those three words, exactly what I look for, and they can all be broken down into smaller things, but those are, that's like the umbrella of everything that's involved with snapping. Um, and you might be able to even to uh, apply it to kicking. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not a kicking guy. 
But uh, looking at balance, you know, going from the grip to the stance to the follow through, uh, everything's got to be balanced. That really helps be able to be consistent. If you're not balanced, you see guys that their hands fly all over the place, they're popping away from their finish, they're out of control. Uh, that's one thing that's huge with snappers. So if I see a guy that's not balanced, I already can just kind of think in my head, hey, you probably have these issues. And they're like, yeah, how'd you know? Like, well, I can just tell from how you're set up that these are probably some tendencies that you have. Um, if we're looking at efficiency, just the efficiency of how they move. How they move is the biggest thing that most guys struggle with and the biggest thing that clashes, okay? Because the, the one piece of information, you go YouTube long snappers, you go Google it, you're going to see hitch. Don't hitch. Hitching, hitching, hitch. Everybody says hitch, but nobody, nobody really knows what that means. So definition-wise, a hitch is going to be anything that makes your motion choppy, gives the opponent a tell. So when they watch my snappers, well, if you're from the outside looking in, all my guys have a hitch, okay, because their ball leaves the ground. But if we're looking at their snap, ball's gone. Right, so it's like, well, technically, I think that they have a hitch, but it looks super smooth. So, what's going on here? Uh, and so, the biggest difference here is when with what I'm teaching with efficiency, it's more of a whipping motion. Everything's going fluidly back, back. Everything's getting pulled to the punter. If you watch any NFL snapper, they all would technically hitch according to everybody's definition. So, my question for them is like, okay, if, if the guys at the top are doing what you think is a negative thing, then, all right, go for it. Do it, do the absolute opposite of what they're doing. Um, I think there's just confusion. You know, one of the big things I coach is, is utilizing the core. And as far as I know, nobody else works on that. Um, and and it's, it's a real travesty because I think everybody that I touch makes progress with their core and they're like, wow, that makes it so much easier, more efficient, more fluid, more control. Um, so, that the hitch part is a big thing that I struggle with, and, and that's the efficiency part. So looking at just making it fluid, and I, I can even show you some clips of film with some of my NFL guys and, and kind of talk about that a little bit more in detail. But um, the last piece, control, you know, all, it all is tied together. You can't have one without the other, and if you're struggling in one area, you're going to struggle in another area. Control, that, all that means is are you able to control your body, or do you pop away at the finish? Do you uh, shove yourself too far? Do you tip over? You know, there's a lot of little things that snappers do, little tendencies, and they're, sometimes they're easy fixes and sometimes they're complete overhauls with their form. But overall, it's, uh, it's a matter of just looking at the fine details. Yeah, no doubt, 100%. I would love for you to do that. If you could pull that up here in a, in a minute. But, um, yeah, well, one of the first things you said about balance, too, I think that is – that's your base, right? That is your, your, your very start. You know, that's one of the first things you notice. How do you help your guys find a good base? Because this is something I've ran into and seen. Do you have, you know, specific steps? I know everyone has to approach the ball. You know, what do you do for base? Right. So as far as base goes, the biggest questions I always get is how far do my feet need to be and where should my weight be? So as far as width, there's kind of a happy medium. Obviously, you don't want to be super wide because it's going to be tough to transition to your release or to your block. Um, and the other side, if you're super narrow, your knees are going to have to widen out just to get your arms through your legs. So if we find a happy medium there, I always tell guys just outside shoulder width, press your knees out. And what that does is that allows guys to have a little more tension in their hips, a little more control over their body, um, just like they would squat. Okay. And everybody's got a little bit of different squat form too, but we're also applying it to reaching between your legs as well. Um, balance as far as front to back and, and how, where your weight should be. I always tell guys that the, your knees should be over your shoelaces. So if I'm watching film and their knees are over their toes, their weight's forward. If their weight's forward when they snap, they're going to be going forward. Um, some guys see that as a benefit because, well, hey, I got a release. But if they're snapping and falling into the release, then they're probably shorting their finish. They're probably not being consistent with their follow through. Um, and there's the snap and then there's football, right? Be a snapper, and then you can go play football. And there should be a clean-cut dividing point. And it shouldn't be like snap, and then there's a gap of time where you do nothing, and then you play. It should be clean-cut, one right butt up to the next, where there's a transition, and the transition needs to be clean. 
But in order to do that, you should be balanced and be able to hold your follow through for a split second just to be able to get your hands to your target, lock it in, not allow any sinking or popping away or, or movement with your body. Um, yeah, I think also to, also to keep that balance too, right? I mean, somebody goes yeah. on a snap and then explode out. You almost want to sit back into it. That's from my understanding, right? Sit back into it for your follow through and then release. Right. It's finished and then you can get out. And so one thing I think, you know, just going through my Instagram and watching videos, the, a couple of words I want snappers to be able to describe my guys as is crisp, clean, and efficient. If you watch a snap and it's just out and you can just watch the ball go and the body of the snapper was just done and then gone or done and then blocking, that's what we're looking for. If you watch a snapper and they're like sloppy and they're moving and there's up and down and left and right, it, that's not clean. You know, it, it's not only not visually appealing, but it's not efficient as well. It's not going to help the snapper snap the ball faster. It's not going to help them be consistent. Um, and I think that's a, a big, big thing that a lot of guys get just from watching YouTube. Hey, you got to throw the ball as hard as you can. You got to kick yourself back as far as you can go just to get that speed. Uh, but if you watch any other sport, you know, where you're throwing an implement, you don't leave the ground to produce power. And a big thing that I talk about with my snappers is power transfer. If you're going to build up power through a movement, you need to be able to transfer that into the ball. And the way you do that is by keeping contact with the ground and allowing that power to shift into the ball. So if we're sliding the feet, a lot of times guys, when they slide their feet, they're going to be popping away because their body's out of control and their hips are vertical instead of leaning back. Or if they're hopping and their feet leave the ground, whether it's partially or completely, I, I consider that the same thing as if a baseball player tried to jump and hit a home run you're like well yeah that would be stupid but my coach said i need to hop or jump back when i snap like okay so there's conflicting things there um and i've had guys like tell me they're coming from that that school of thought of i need to drive everything backwards and they're like yeah but where am i going to get my power from and then we talk about how it's it's more like, more like a pitcher i want you to instead of driving off the rubber as hard as you can and throwing the ball hard i want you to worry more about how you move and the length you get in the order that you move, that's where your speed's gonna come from, not just throwing yourself back towards that catcher or down the, down the mound towards the catcher. So I think that's the biggest difference. And they see a big difference. Like when they get it all to click, their feet don't move, they use their body efficiently. Sometimes they feel like they didn't throw a fast ball, but if you're catching that thing, you can feel an immediate difference. And, the, and what I kind of uh, categorize that as, it's just they finally found that efficiency, and that's the effortless feeling. It's the same thing as a kicker. If you hit the sweet spot and you do it right, you shouldn't feel like you have to kick it hard to make it go far. So snappers have a sweet spot. It's just not a contact thing. It's a movement piece um, and how you control that body. Now, real quick, too, this is something I wondered about, and I've seen this a lot since I've been coaching specialists and special teams. Uh, talk to me about feet and an alignment of feet. I know a guy, a lot of guys have a common air of uh, their heels turning in, and then when they snap, their heels come together. Right. Uh, is that something that, you know, a lot of guys do when they're starting out? Is that fixable? How do you work on that? I think it's only common if you're coming from the school of thought of driving back. Okay. Right. So I don't have issues with that because my guys don't slide their feet. Uh, having your feet slightly in or out, you know, if you got some kind of muscle, difference, you know, tightness or looseness or whatever, anything with your body. Sometimes you might be a little more duck footed than straight toed. I don't think it's the end of the world, but if you can be as straight as possible, I think it helps with alignment. You know, if you can line your feet up, your knees up, your hips up, that helps guys line up straight to the punter and it makes it easier to just fire a ball straight back. I've noticed that if the guys are a little more duck footed, whether that's a physical thing that they're going to have a tough time correcting, whether it's a muscle imbalance or anything like that, or it's just comfortable. Sometimes they have a tough time seeing straight lines because their feet are going like this, their hips are going like this. Sometimes their balls sometimes offset because of uh, another muscle imbalance. So I've had some guys that are pretty crooked with their hips shift one way, their arms reach the other way. And, uh, as, as a long snapping coach, that's not always my area of correction. Like I'm like, hey, you gotta get to a muscle therapist or a chiropractor that can help you balance your body out in the meantime, we're going to kind of like play your hook, right? Like let's, let's deal with it. Let's figure out ways to 
not just put a bandaid on it, but let's make some, some corrections. But with your body, that's going to be on you on your own time. Yeah, I bet that's hard, especially for long timers, because, you know, it's so important for your whole body to be in tune and straight back. You know, if you have some kind of imbalance in your hips, that needs to be taken care of because that can alter your whole whole form, correct? Well, and, and you know what? Sometimes, sometimes it is a big deal and sometimes it's not. Like, for example, I used to, when I sank my hips down, my hips would twist a little bit to my right because my right glute was stronger. And I didn't have an issue with it. I knew that where I lined up, I'd snap it straight back. But when I started going to pro camps, I'd have a punter right behind me. I'd sink down and they scoot over because they thought that's where I'd be snapping it. So I'd have to talk to them be like, you just stay where you're at. I promise it'll come to you. Uh, and so in that instance, if the snapper's comfortable and they know where it's going to go, it's fine. It's probably no big deal. If they're cranking their hips over and that's where the ball's going, then yeah, maybe we can correct something. Maybe it's an alignment issue, a sight line, uh, or even just body position. So for your, you're talking about the feet earlier, all right? And I like this because right. it's, it's different. It's unique. You know, a lot of guys teach for their long snappers to scrape back and take their energy straight back, which is what you hit on before. So what do you tell your guys then and, and where are they getting that power from their lower body? Yep. So the lower body is for control. It's not for power. And I, that's the biggest difference. And I'm not just being different to be different. And I think some people might think that like, ah, he's just trying to be innovative. Um, innovation has taken me a long way. The last uh, four, five years, I've, in the last four years, I've had five NFL long snappers and they all have come through me. It's not like hey, they just start, started working with me because, you know, um, they're all doing the same techniques that we're talking about right now. And, you know, a lot of it is just trusting that process. And it all comes back to power transfer, right? If we're going to throw a punch, okay, if I throw a punch, not only do my hips have to rotate first, that creates that torque, but they have to rotate and then stop so I can throw that punch. If I rotate my hips and then keep rotating them, that's not going to hurt if you just keep swinging everything past, right? In, uh, I always like to use like throwing discus or shot put as a college thrower. Um, that's what, it's what I know. And so I help, I, I like to use those examples, but if you're throwing anything, you need to have a block. So as a discus thrower, you rotate around that left side has to stop and pull. And that's what allows you to really whip that discus out into the field. That block applies to everything you, that you throw, a football, a baseball, uh, snapping. So when you're applying it to the snap, your block is your lower body. Everything's coming through, your core is coming through, your hands are following. If you start to jump, you're going to either pop away or dig too deep through your legs and end up shoving the ball. But if you can create that block with your lower body and your feet stick in the ground, you're going to create more of a whipping effect instead of a shoving effect. Now, not only does that give you a faster ball because of that power transfer aspect, but it also helps you drive the ball where you want it to go. So many snappers are taught to reach towards that punter as far as they can. Well, when they reach through, they really lengthen out their body and they throw themselves further through, but not under control. If a snapper is able to compact their body and crack that whip, not only can I point to the target like I wanted to, but I can also see where I'm pointing my hands, just like a, uh, somebody shooting a gun, right? If I'm shooting a rifle, I look down the barrel, I don't shoot from the hip. So that's how I explain it. You shove through, not only are you out of control, but you're shooting from the hip. If you're under control, you can see where it's coming from and you can control that body a little bit more too. Right, so your power is coming more from your core and, and upper body instead of trying to force your whole body uh, at the spot. Absolutely. That's so actually, I, I pulled up a clip here of my, uh, my snapper with the Vikings that we can take a look at. Go ahead, here. All right, so what we're looking at here is uh, the Minnesota Vikings long snapper, Austin Cutting, working on being efficient, being controlled with his movement. So what we see is as he moves, he's able to get his core moving first. His ball follows. It lifts off the ground, but it's always getting pulled back to the target. We can see his legs acting as a block here. They stop before that ball's thrown, and that's what really transfers that power into the ball. So if we go back to the start. Let's click play here. We can just watch how whippy he is and how controlled he is at the finish. So the more controlled you can be, the easier it is to be consistent. He knows exactly what this feeling feels like when he hits that every time so he can repeat that. A lot of guys that are out of control with their body, they have a sense of like 
when to release it or what it should kind of feel like, he has exact landmarks to hit every single snap. So that's what really makes him consistent with what he does is not only the efficiency part, but the control aspect too. Now going back to that ball lift, right? Hey, my ball's lifted off the ground. I must have a hitch, right? But everything's always moving back to the target. And that's the difference. Like he's pitching a fastball right now. He's not trying to slide the ball. He's not trying to just use his effort. All my snappers never snap with more than 80, 85%. Once you get past that percentage of effort, you start to lose control. So even here, he's got a little bit of movement after the ball's out. The more he can clean that up, the better, right? And if he went 90, 100%, his body would be harder to control. What movement are you talking about there? So just a little bit of, once he's done, his head should be stationary right here, okay? Mm -hmm. He comes up just a hair. I see that. That's me being picky, okay? But if we can make sure that he's working on this and just really sticking this head position, core position, it really makes a difference with his ability to control the ball. So in this situation here, the, the legs serve as that block, right? Like once his arms go past that certain point, the legs are that block that, you know, stops that uh, the energy or the momentum from going totally back and out of control. Yep. And actually here, uh, I got another one for you. Here's a right. video of Luke Rhodes. Love it, man. Love seeing a lot the people, live clips. A lot of people know Luke. So well, it doesn't make it any better. We'll just keep it this way. So we can see stance-wise, a little bit what we talked about as far as the knees over the shoelaces, flat back. As we watch him move, we see his core pulling. We see his arms lifting that ball up in the air. His feet stop and stick. Then his ball finishes. He's looking right down his barrel of his target. Now, if we play it fast, he's cracking a whip there. Now, let's go back. He did a couple reps here. Let's watch this first one, too. This one was probably a little bit more controlled and whippy that ball's following comes off the ground like a pitcher legs stop ball drives through body's controlled he's pointing right at the hip so this is what i mean like when you look at this you can just be like hey that's crisp that's clean that looked efficient and you're like wow that looked good now Absolutely. and it's not he he's not doing that just because he's a good athlete he's doing that because he's a technician and one thing that um, I like to share about Luke is when we first met, like, hell yeah, he was a great athlete. He was jacked. He was uh, super into lifting and CrossFit, uh, but he was brand new to snapping. So his story is, is different than a lot of people's stories where he never snapped in high school or college. He was just like, got cut from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Colts picked him up and they're like, hey, uh, we're looking for a snapper. He's like, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you want me to. Let me make the team. And so he practiced it. He did enough to like, get pretty good at it and that's when we got in touch is after that process and, and they're like hey we'll cut this other guy if you want the job and he's like yeah let's do it I'll become a full-time snapper and then he was like what did I get myself into so then we worked on the technique the details complicating it so we can simplify it um, and he's he's really been a student of the game which has been really cool because you would think a guy that you know just kind of naturally gifted with athleticism what, did, what does he need technique for right but it's crazy the difference. He just sent me film last week um, and he was just on the money, controlling his body. And we had another breakthrough where a lot of NFL snappers think I have to snap the ball and go, 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 go. And I have to be quick and hard and aggressive. And I always tell guys, the, the smoother, the more controlled, the more relaxed you can be, the faster you'll be. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. He had a practice where he finally had that happen. And I was like, how were the snaps? He was like, money, right on the, right on the money every single time. And I was like, did you feel like you tried hard? He's like, no, I was, I was super chill. I was just going through it. I was like, did you still have a step on your opponent? He's like, yeah. He's like, oh, I get it now. Uh, and so everybody's always learning, you know, even at the highest levels, you, you still got to look at little details and there's always little pieces that nobody's perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. Everybody has something to always learn. That is really cool. And I think that's something huge for a lot of people don't know or that can definitely learn is that even specialists at the highest of levels, you know, they're always looking for a way to get, you know, one up their competition and get better, you know, and there's always something you can alter or work through. Let's talk a little bit about Luke because, yeah, he's he's one of your, uh, you know, no well-known clients and he, you know, how did he first get in contact with you? 
So it was kind of funny. So I had a client that played for um, a school on the East Coast, and he was going to this gym, and he's like, he texts me all the time, dude, Luke Rhodes is here. He plays for the Colts. So I'm like, that's pretty cool, man. Let you know If you ever want to pitch me to him, let me know. And he's like, okay. He's like, hey, he's working on a snapping. I'm going to go snap with him. This guy's kind of a talker, so I know he's going to talk to talk to Luke. And uh, eventually one day he was like, yeah, hey, Luke, Luke wants your number. And I was like, sweet, you know, let's, let's connect. And he sent me a clip of film. He's like, hey, I've been having an issue. What can you, you know, can you give me some advice? I put in my, uh, I use Huddle Technique to break down film. And I put in my app, did a voiceover. And he was like, dude, you saw all that just from that one clip? And I was like, yeah, there's a, and there's a lot more we can work on. And then he was just like instantly sold. And we just kind of started building a relationship and working on things from there. But what um, was that, that first common error that he was kind of struggling with at that point that you helped him with? Do you remember? You know, it's, it's hard to remember, but I, I want to I say it was something with his body control, just not being able to hit the same position every single time um, and absolutely going into like having a balanced grip. So I know a lot of snappers will, they'll just get a grip that's comfortable or someone will tell them, you know, just do whatever you like, find something that works for you, where I have the complete opposite viewpoint on that, where I know that if you don't start balanced with your grip, you can't end balanced. It's physically impossible. So if I use an unbalanced grip, I'm going to have an unbalanced finish. Now, it's not the end of the world, but it's not going to help you. Um, and that's kind of going back to the effective over efficient, right? You know, which one do you want to be? So Luke was having an issue with his non-dominant hand leaving early, his right hand doing more. So we're seeing more of that upward flick with the dominant hand. So just talking about why balanced, what's it going to do for you, how's it going to help, and how to take steps at, at, at moving in the right direction. So um, I use a lot of softballs for drills. And so Luke has become a softball expert and a sniper with one. And that's been a world of difference for him and for all my clients that, that use those drills because it exposes you and it forces you to be better. You know, anybody, like, I always get kids that are like, hey, I tried that softball drill and I, I hit the ball. I was like, sweet, but what'd you do with your body? How did you do it? How'd you make it consistent? I'm like, I don't know, I just hit the ball. So that's cool. I'm glad that they're taking drills and trying them out. But at the same time, there's a whole other side of that story where there's so many little details that we're working on, like in a session or virtually, that so many people are missing out on just by, you know, trying to save a couple bucks and coaching themselves. And I understand, you know, a private coach is not for everybody. I know I'm not cheap, but you get what you pay for sometimes, right? And, and if you want to go and make it to the, the next level or if you want to uh, be as good as you can, it doesn't hurt. You know, it's not, I'm not saying that that's what you have to do, but it doesn't hurt to have somebody that has an extra set of eyes on you, right? So. 100%. And if you want to work with the best, you work with Kyle there. Um, <laughs> what, uh, you talked about the softballs and, and talk a little bit more about that. I know, uh, you know, why, why do you like using it, you know, and, and why not use a ball and, and, and tell us just your train of thought on softballs there. Yeah. So softballs were something, uh, like a lot of the drills I have, I was just kind of spitballing one day and had a piece of equipment laying around and I just tried something new. Um, so at the time I was at a, a baseball facility, a softball facility. There was these pitching machine softballs everywhere. So one day I was like, hey, you know what? I think going off of a premise of, I think maybe I watched a baseball video on YouTube or something and I'm trying to find different coaching cues from different sports to pull in. Uh, I found that just messing around that if I hold it just like a football, if I'm balanced, I can get it to go straight and follow my target. If I'm unbalanced, that thing's going to dart off in different directions. So just utilizing a different object was forcing me to make sure that I was focused on the process and not just the product. And that's something that I always overcoach too. It's like, hey man, it, it, don't worry about the process or the, the product for now. If you focus on the process and how you're doing it, what you're doing and how to make you physically different and better, the process will come. The product will come, sorry. Uh, process is over product, right? So, but a lot of guys are, are flipped. They want to see that pretty ball right now. The instant gratification. Everybody's got a cell phone. Kids these days, you know? Uh, <laughs> makes me sound old. Sound like an old guy, yeah. I know, right? But with that being said too, like it, it's, that's, that's how it is. I, I'm the same way. I would love to see everybody just be perfect right now. But from experience, I understand like what has to go into it. And as soon as I can get guys to realize that, they're like, okay, I get it. It is a process and they see it and they, they thrive from it. But that's one thing where it's going to piss you off. 
It's going to force you to do something different. And if you're not balanced now, you're going to have to be balanced at the finish to make that uh, result be what we want it to be. No, hundred percent. And I, I do like it too, because it's, you know, it's a great way of thinking. Like let's take cross training from other sports, you know, and as a, you know, use those same coaching points with our guys too. I like that because it's, it's against the grain and a lot of guys are scared to make up their own things, you know? So that's really cool. I think it's really helpful for your guys. Oh, absolutely. And just coming from a teaching background, um, you just know that like there's other sports that have been around a while. Like for baseball, I love to use baseball examples because everybody knows what a baseball pitcher should look like. That's just like, you see somebody throw a baseball, you're like, that's how you should do it. You see someone like lead with their throwing arm foot and throw a ball, you're like, that's wrong. But on the other side of it, snapping isn't as popular. You watch somebody throw their hands and then their head or like something looks goofy. They're like, hey man, that ball got there. They did good. They're not like, you know what? Something looked off, right? And I think that's a big difference where like, that's, that's why I think I have a, such an uphill battle with guys is because yeah, you can just throw it back there any way you want to. And technically you're a long snapper, right? But if you're efficient, it's going to be not only easier for you, but you're going to have that wow factor as well. So that's, that's difficult for me as far as like, why do I have to do it differently? You know, I'm getting the ball there. I'm pretty good. I'm an effective long snapper. Like, yeah, you are effective. But the efficiency is a different story. Efficiency. Efficiency is the key word. Um, so, you know, when you were talking about, you just hit on it too, uh, you know, hands going and then head. I'm sure that's a common problem you see. Why does that come about and how do you work on it with guys to fix it? Well, you remember that word we said earlier, that, that, that naughty word, hitch? It just all stems from that. You got coaches out there that say, you have a hitch, fix it. And so their fix is drag the ball, pull the ball back right away. And so then we have snappers pulling the ball and then trying to use their core. So they're shoving the ball back instead of throwing it or pitching it. So back to the pitching reference, if I saw a pitcher like throw it and then turn their body, you'd be like, what the heck are they doing? You know, that looks dumb. Like clearly that's not efficient. But you watch a snapper do it and you're like, you're killing it, man. You don't have a hitch anymore. So that's, that's one thing that a lot of guys struggle with, and it's a lot of misinformation, um, probably from coaches that have great intentions that just are uh, they're done trying to uh, improve themselves in that area, right? Um, and that's – it is what it is. There's going to be guys like that all over the place, and that's, that's uh, evident in every sport, every level, right? You get coaches that are – they know what they're talking about. They're the expert. Why get better, right? And that, I think that's different too, like even here. I have this whole space and a lot of times it's just me in here by myself, just trying to figure out a new drill. What can I do with some weights or a med ball or a pad or a t-shirt, you know, MacGyver, some kind of new drill. And, and it's not just to make a new drill. It's to help somebody that's not understanding what I already have in place. Hey, I need you to not slide the ball. I need you to throw your head first. And if I have a guy that their other coach was like ball, ball, ball first, and I'm telling them the opposite, they're not just going to take one drill big. Oh, yeah, I get it. Uh, they, technically, they get it. They understand what they're doing. But reteaching the body how to move is a completely different thing. So if I just gave them one drill, it's like, that's how you got to do it. And every time they set me film, I'm like, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. You're not doing it. That's exactly what I hated about when I was a snapper. Okay, I'm not doing it. How can I do it better? So if that drill's not working, let's get something to do. Let's, let's create something new. Let's just try something different. It's an experiment, right? So I think, like you said, a lot of people are scared to do that. At, for the longest time, I was too. You know, you get a snapper that uh, for a while, I was working with primarily high school guys and I'd get a college guy and I'd be like, hey, I know this balance grip thing will help you out. And they'd try it and they'd be struggling. And in the back of my head, I'm like, you know what, maybe I should just let them do what they came here doing and everybody will just be happy. You know, like they won't feel like they screwed them up. And at the end of the day, I never let anybody back away from it because I'm like, you know what, I know it's going to help. And so everybody that's come here, if, if they want to improve on something, we've improved on it, even if it was tough. Like I've had some guys, they come, we work, 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 and they didn't leave with it perfected, but they left sign flashes and knowing the drills to perform and how to retrain their body. So that's kind of coming back full circle to that instant gratification. You don't just leave here being perfect. You leave here knowing new knowledge about how to improve yourself, right? And that's, that's hard for a lot of guys at points.
Yeah, but that's so important too because for specialists, it's like you have to be able to coach yourself. You have Absolutely. To, there's no one out there, you know, that, uh, you know, with most teams, you know, 90%, even in college at the level I'm at, from what I've seen and what I've heard from different coaches, 90% of these programs don't have a guy like right. you, like yourself, that knows all about snapping, you know. So you got to be able to coach yourself up. And, and that's important to, even if there's rough times, to learn uh, those techniques that you're teaching there. So I think that's so important. Right. Um, going back a little bit, and I, I don't know how much you know about this, but I'm very interested to see, you know, where did the long snapping, you know, training or industry start? Who were the foremost guys? For me personally, all I really know knew about when I was playing uh, in high school was, was you know, Rubio uh, long right. snapping. And being a West Coast guy, that's probably why too. But, you know, can you tell me, you know, where your knowledge uh, of, of the history of, of snapping trainers comes from? Yeah, you know what? I'm not sure why it all started. I, you know, I, obviously there was a need, right? Um, and, you know, even when I was playing, it was only these big camps. Like you could either go to a big camp or you could just go off on your own, right? Um, and so I think that was able to build a, a big increase in interest in, in the position. Like, oh, they, you can actually do this. And a lot of guys going into camps and, and just figuring it out was great but it left a big opening in like, okay, I go to a couple camps every year, but then what do I do in the meantime? Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's something that I saw a need for, like even when I was done playing college football, I think as I was playing college football, they, there was nobody in my area that did it. And I was like, you know, I could help some guys out, you know, why not? Right. Um, so I helped a couple local guys and, and looking back at it, I was teaching them what I did and I didn't, really know what I was doing either. So like, that was my learning experience, kind of like a student teaching atmosphere. Like you go in, you figure some things out and you, you learn from it. So uh, I wish I could go back with those guys I was working with back then and tell them what I know now, but it was necessary as me to grow as a coach as well. And like I said, I'm always trying to professionally develop myself. And, and that's something that I think is extremely important. If you want to make a difference in, in not only uh, the athletes lives, but, even your own, like you can't just be stuck in the mud, just keep doing what you're doing, right? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I think that's, it's so vital and coaches seem to do it from where, what I've seen, but you know, there's not enough people like yourself that are out there, you know, teaching about long time. I mean, even guys that run specialist camps, you know, for kickers and punters, you know, they don't really know a whole lot about long snapping, you know, they might just throw someone out there who snapped before. Yeah, so I see that a lot. And, you know, it's it's all – they have the best interest in mind and they, they want to get guys better. But, you know, even with my college guys, I wouldn't trust them to coach anybody, you know, any of my clients because they're a college guy. You know, they're, they're still learning themselves. And even if they think they're really good, are they a good teacher? Maybe, maybe not, you know. So it's kind of – you're kind of rolling the dice when you just bring somebody in to do it, you know. Uh, not that they were, they're going to be bad, but – yeah, you know, look, look, looking back at like if somebody would have brought me in when I was in college, like I kind of cringe. Like, well, I didn't know what I was talking about back then, so I kind of feel bad for those snappers that are just getting some random advice from somebody who's got the best intentions in mind, right? So it is what it is, but I think you know, hopefully, these guys are doing the same thing and trying to professionally develop and learn as they go. Yeah, and I think you're right. At the end of the day, everyone does seem to have the best intentions in mind, you know. So it's not a fault on them that. You know, they're, they're well, and I think the other thing, too, is, like, everybody, you know, thinks they're the expert or wants to be the expert. And I think in this industry, if you don't think you're the best at what you do, then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, like, I think I'm the best long snapping coach there is. You know, and if I didn't think that, then why would you train with me? Right? If, if I was like, you know what, there's other guys that are better than me. You should probably train with them. Then what, what am I doing? I'm charging. I'm taking money for nothing then, right? So... Um, not that you should have an ego, but I think that you should be very confident in what you're teaching and what you're doing um, and be able to back it up with, you know, not only science, but uh, results, right? So uh, there's always those little aspects with it too. And I think coming from a teaching background and, and learning about how to mold lessons um, around a student and how to um, support that is, is extremely important. Absolutely. Now, do you still teach? Is that uh, something you still do actively? Yeah, so I actually, I'm a specially designed physical education teacher here in, in Eau Claire. 
um, which basically means I work with special needs students in physical education. So we work on throwing, catching, kicking, running, you know, like basically any kind of low level skills that these kids need. Um, but I actually think that really helps me with my coaching because I have kids that they don't speak, they're deaf, they are blind, they use a wheelchair, um, they have severe autism, right? So a lot of uh, very varying um, disabilities, but I can teach them to do a lot of different stuff. These athletes that are very capable of doing a lot of different things, it's easy sometimes. And I think that's where adapting a drill or adapting something that we teach a client here is, is not too difficult sometimes because I get, I get the extreme end. And here, I don't get spit on or bit. So uh, it makes a big difference too. Like, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of hazard uh, with working with a different population that I don't get while I'm here. And I, I really like the, the diversity of athletes and, and kids I get to work with. Yeah, majority of the time, you don't get spit on a bit. With majority, them, right? It hasn't happened yet, but you never know. Uh, sweat on, um, <laughs> ran into, knocked over, yes. But usually not on purpose. No doubt, no doubt. You know, it's, it's funny, too, that you mentioned that, though, with teaching, 100%. I mean, you're having to teach kids who don't have all their, you know, senses, so you might have to use different teaching methods. And that's something I was so glad I got to do. You know, I was contemplating – should I go from GAing right into, you know, a college coaching career or do I take my master's that I, you know, worked hard to earn and, and let me teach for a little while. And I'm so glad I did because just like yourself, I learned so many different ways. Kids don't learn, you know, just by writing it down or, or seeing a video of it. They have to do it. They have to, you know, multiple different ways of teaching it. They have to see it. They have to hear, you know, coaching methods and coaching tips on, on the subject itself. So, that is a very good point that I'm sure has really helped you coaching your long snappers. Absolutely. And I think one thing that a lot of people don't know is like, it's easy to forget things. Like even as a teacher, you, what you just said is absolutely true. But sometimes as a coach, you're in the moment, you're like, how can I get them to learn this? And you're like, just do it, just do it, just do it. Let me kind of show you, then you just do it. I have a whiteboard in here. And every time that somebody has like a, a light bulb moment, I'm like, go write it down, write it down. Tell me how you're doing it. Explain it to me. Let's do the drill. Let's apply it. And that's one of the best ways I've had guys just be able to retain stuff. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, take a picture of that board. What did we talk about? There's a hundred different thoughts up there, but now you can go through when you go home, you can look at it and be like, you know what? We did work on this aspect and this thing, and this thing. Oh, and there's a cue. I, okay. I forgot about that one. That's a good one that I can remember to help me with these certain things. Uh, but just applying the, the teaching methods that we were able to learn has been uh, absolutely invaluable. Man, Kyle, you were dropping gems now, man. I, <laughs> I love the writing down thing. And actually, I got my you know idea for that. And when I played, every day after practice, I wrote down you know what I was doing or what I learned from a kicking coach. And that, in turn, turned into the Kicker's Bible. You can go find that on my website, icewindkicking.com. Subtle plug. But you know, the whole thing with that is, is so important because yeah, it helped me retain information. Talk to me about what you guys do for your snappers. I love hearing that writing on the whiteboard. Do you make your snappers keep a record of everything they learn or, or how do you have them, you know, record, you know, what do you have them write down? Right. So right now, like in a private session, we use the whiteboard and that's something they take a photo of, they can take it with them. Um, as far as like the memberships go, where it's a consistent meeting every month, we get that virtual feedback. Uh, through videos. I have a running like Google Doc with them. Every time we meet, I talk about here are your issues, here are the drills that we're hitting to do it. They can add to that, they can take their own notes, but there's always something in the same place. Um, I, and you can tell, like, if a guy's like just sitting there and I'm typing it up, what I talk to them about, and I can tell they're not taking notes, they're the ones that the next week they're like, hey, coach, what was that drill you talked about? Um, and so you can kind of tell. And then there's guys that they're taking notes along with me. I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to bump you down a couple lines in this Google Doc because you're screwing with what I'm typing. But they're like, they're typing books. I'm like, that's awesome because I know they're soaking it in and trying to figure it all out. Uh, but then also they're getting video feedback anytime they send films. So they're getting these videos of me voicing it over, drawing lines, telling them exactly what to look for. Um, and that's super invaluable. They can they save that. They have that for their own personal um, library just to go back and be like, Hey, what did he tell me last time? I can look at that video and I can research it. And they also have film of other clients of mine, of me doing drills, 
whatever I got to do to get my point across um, to help them maintain and retain uh, that knowledge that they've just built. You heard it here first, man. Special teams, you, you get the full package of everything. That's awesome. I, shoot, if I was a long snapper, I would definitely want that. And just access to the other guys. Obviously, you've trained some great long snappers. So access to their film and, and seeing what they do is fantastic. For sure. Well, and that's something I get a lot of guys. They're like, hey, you know, I'm struggling with this drill. Can you show me a video of Luke doing it? Like, uh, And so, yeah, throw them a video of Luke or whoever else they want to see. A lot of it comes down to like, Hey, I'm a free agent. I'm working on my footwork. Can you show me what that looks like? I'm like, oh yeah, I got some film of all my NFL guys working on it here. Certain steps, certain body positions, uh, the timing of everything. So that's that's usually a big cue with guys wanting different film. Is like, hey, can you show me what the pros look like? Because that's that's not out there. Or if you see NFL film, it's like game film. It's like, well, what can you pick apart from there? It's just balls gone. Maybe you see something you were looking for, or maybe you don't even know what you're looking for. Exactly. Well, I think that's a big thing, too. They don't really know what to clue in on and focus on there. Um, you know, something that you were talking about, as I heard you mention before, was, you know, cues and having a mental cue. Well, also, too, your, your coaching points and common errors. That's what I call it, and that's how I have it written down in my book. I think that's, that's great. That's exactly how I coach it. Like, okay, here's your common error. Here's what you've been screwing a lot. Here's how we fix it. And then you just dissect, you know, everything, um, every phase, just like that, you know. So I think that's really cool. But your mental cues there, you were talking about, you, I heard you say a cue, you know, yeah. what are some cues and, and how does it help you guys? Wow, where do we start? Um, so, I mean, every little piece of the motion has a cue. And I always tell guys, if you don't know how to cue that movement with your body, you don't know how to replicate it. So, for example... Uh, we talked about, you know, the motion of like hitching or whipping your body through. If you don't know how, what that feels like to pull your core through or to let those elbows bend and come from behind your head, when you get down there, you just throw the ball. Is it happening? What did it feel like? How can you recreate that? So I, we go through so many different drills just to get them to be aware of their body, to make sure that it looks right and it feels different. And then once they actually do it, I'm like, what'd that feel like? What, what happened? They're like, well, it felt weird. It felt crappy. Sweet. Make it feel crappy again. You know? And a lot of times they have that reaction because it's different. It's new. And if, if something's new, it's not probably going to feel great right away. You know? And I think a lot of guys have that in their head. Like when, when I do finally what coaches ask me to do, it's going to be like fireworks are going off and everything's just going to be perfect. No, it's probably not going to feel great because you're not used to it. So, um, yeah, and then every little cue they get, write it down. Let's think about it. Let's come up with a, a way to phrase it for them and a way to remember it. So that chop and, and you know, something actually that I talked about with going a little bit back on, on some of your drills that you worked on. Like yeah. we had Tim O'Donnell that was on, you know, a few episodes ago. And it was really cool to hear him say he got with his strength coaches because he loved being in the weight room. And a lot of snappers do. Uh, some don't. But uh, he had the bands around his chest, yep. uh, his, you know, forearms, and he was working on that crunch and that whip, and I thought that was awesome. Is there anything you do to work on that explosive movement of activating that core? Yeah. So it's funny. Tim was also a client of mine. Uh, doing the whole crunching thing was brand new to him, too. So it's cool that he's able to now be able to help other guys out with that, that process as well. So um, kind of going into the mental side of it, I'm focused less on the aggressiveness and the speed of it as I am the, just the order of it all because I think that's what most guys struggle with. Now, if I have a guy that's advanced, we might work on speeding it up a little bit, but I found that when we're teaching a new movement, there is, if we have two levels here, one side is technique, one side is effort. In order to get that technique level up, we have to drop the effort level in order for that to move freely. We can learn more technique with less effort. And then once we have that technique in place, we can slowly sprinkle in a little more effort until we find that level where, hey, I hit a little too much effort, my technique level struggled. We back it down and we try to figure out that balancing act. So it's the same case even with like Luke and Austin and Jacob and Ross and Zach, all those guys I have the same thing. You know, that's what we talked about before as far as like snapping effort percentage. If you are snapping as hard as you can, there goes your technique level probably. Now, doesn't mean your snaps are going to completely suck, but you're going to lose a little bit of length, a little, lose a little bit of control probably. 
Um, and so it's really important to maintain as much of that as possible. And one thing that I really high on is kind of over coaching uh, certain aspects, because I know that if we do them in practice, we do them in drills, when you get into a game mode and you think less and you just are flying by the seat of your pants, things are going to condense. You're going to lose some things. It may not be perfect, but if you train yourself a certain way, when things do condense, when you lose a little bit of that whip, when you lose a little bit of that control, it's not complete garbage. It's still controlled. It's not as controlled. And that's part of being a perfectionist too. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, it is. It is. It's about finding that balance. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. Balance is huge in everything. Absolutely. And especially in snapping too, having that balance and being able to actually knowing your body, you know, and body awareness. That's huge. And that's something a lot of younger guys struggle with. So even just learning how to move their bodies in different ways, their hips, their torso, their legs, right? Like, most young guys, I'm like, hey, you have to move your hips. And they're like trying to figure out and they don't know how. So we have drills to work on that or using their thoracic spine. Like, I don't know how to bend it. Even some older guys, you get guys that you can tell they're gym rats. They've been in the movement world for a while. They can figure it out. Younger guys, they're still new to lifting. They're still discovering their bodies in general. They struggle with it. And so the technique that we're teaching here isn't easy. And you got to baby step your way through some other processes before it becomes easier. But that part of it is just being aware of your body. How do you work the hips or how do you work them, their awareness of their thoracic spine? What's something that you work with your guys? A lot of it's different stretches and a lot of just like groundwork. I mean, you could just YouTube like, hey, how do I stretch my thoracic spine? And they're going to show you some different stretches to do it. Uh, a lot of it's just putting yourself into a, like a rolled in position to stretch that upper back. Um, the hip hip rocking is something that most guys don't look at or think about. And it's kind of an advanced technique even for snapping. But if we can get that mastered, it's going to be huge. Um, and that's all just like tailbone out, tailbone in, um, and rotating from that, that joint. Um, most guys are just stiff as boards and they don't know how to do that in general. But if you look across the sports world, sprinting, your hips rock in order to get that extension and that drive through the body into the ground, um, jumping, you know, there's a lot of other sports that, that you just, you need that for squatting, for example. You can't let that tailbone tuck underneath you. You got to learn how to really go the opposite direction. And that's part of that hip rocking that's one-sided, but a lot of guys struggle with that in general. That's pretty good, too, because I was going to hit on, before we get uh, on common errors with, with young, long snappers, uh, I want to ask you, so you were talking about effort related to technique, right? And if you want technique to be higher, you're going to have to lower the effort. Yep. When you say that, are you talking about maybe doing like slow motion snaps or working on breaking down that snap in a slower way? Or, or how do you lower All the effort? Above. Yeah, so in order to relearn something or reteach your body, learning exactly how to move and slowly is important. Now, there's a lot of snappers that already do a slow motion snaps. But what I always see is they take – a motion and they just move slowly. They don't do anything different. So, you know, when I teach a snapper how to do a slow motion snap in, in my way, it's all about landmarks and exact positions and stretching things, making it extreme. So they understand that feeling of the pattern, but also exact positions. And I can watch them and be like, hey, you didn't hit this landmark. You got to do it a little bit different or a little bit better, make it a little more extreme. Uh, and then we take it, we elevate a little bit, and we start moving things a little smoother, a little faster, and then a bunch of different drills we can scatter in there to make them feel something isolated or fluidly. And then that helps to translate to the snap because it's really hard to take something and do slow motion snaps and then be like, now go full speed. Where is that bridge that you built from the slow drill to the fast snap? And if there's not a bridge, it's not gonna translate. Right, there almost has to be some percentage, right, that they work up to their full speed snap. Yep, exactly. And I think a lot of times guys will just take that slow motion and they'll go faster, 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 and then they'll just try to snap. When that's not a bad way to do it, but I've, I've learned that it's not as effective as like, do it slow, now isolate the front, now isolate the back, now combine them, now isolate this aspect, you know, right? And just isolating different movements helps you think less, focus on something more specific, perfect that one thing uh, and just improve gradually and it's not going to give you that pretty ball right now but it's going to make it better in the long run that is something really cool that you hit on too that i really liked 
and I saw on your Instagram is isolating different movements, you know, the, the front part or the back and then, you know, going, does that, um, does that have a, a consequence, you know, or do you guys end up, you know, maybe getting a little bit confused then when they try to go back to full speed, full speed snap? Do you ever see that at all? No, not typically. And the biggest reason is when, when they're doing drills, they're doing drills. When they're snapping, they're snapping. If it carries over, great. If not, we're back on the drawing board. We're figuring, figuring out a different way to do it. Now, there are times where I have a guy, like, if it's not clicking, it's not happening during the full snap, I'm like, hey, let's force it to happen. You know, we have to try something different. Um, but typically, you do drills, you do your snaps, and we find a way to blend them, right? And I think I've had very few guys that I'm telling them to do something isolated and exaggerated, and that happens exactly the same way in the full snap. I'm like, whoa, you've done too much. Let's dial it down a notch. Very rare. And it's usually guys that are very in tune with their bodies and they know exactly how to move them and, and do different things. Um, they're, they're kind of in the minority there. But at the same time, if they're able to do too much of something I'm asking them to do, I can also help them dial it back pretty easily too. So I'm usually not worried about like, hey, a guy's doing too much whip or anything like that. So I know a lot of guys still are like, well, what if you're lifting your ball too much? If you're using your core, you can't hitch. So the, here's the difference between someone with a hitch, someone without a hitch. Somebody that doesn't use their core, but lifts the ball up is gonna be up and through and be choppy with their movement. Somebody that pulls their core through, even if their arms do come up high, is getting pulled back through towards the target by means of their core being pulled backwards. So I've heard like one piece of advice that I got when I was a younger snapper was, hey man, you have a hitch, put your ball against the wall, put it in a shoe box, and if you touch that box, slide the ball more. So I actually got that advice right before I uh, got signed by the Sacramento Mountain Lions in the UFL. And so it was about two weeks out, and it was this pro snapper that told me, hey man, you got a hitch, you got to fix it if you want to make that team. And I'm like, shit, I better fix this thing. So I was out in my parents' front yard with a snap, this snapping net, um, and I taped a pop can to the middle so I knew where to, where to hit every time, and I couldn't hit the net. I was sliding the ball, didn't have a hitch, but my speed sucked, I, my accuracy sucked, I couldn't throw a spiral to save my life. And it was a couple days before, and I was like, you know what? I got this far, screw it, I'm just gonna do what I was doing and, and make that work. And so I just kind of ignored the advice. Uh, not only did I make the team, but I beat out a guy that had been with the Patriots to get that job, uh, and then we all got fired anyway because the league ran out of money but it was a really cool experience and I think you know once again that snapper had really good intentions but that's what they knew and now looking back at it that snapper had a hitch too right like I don't think they absolutely they don't have a hitch but if they were what they were telling me was correct in their head then they were doing the exact same thing right so it's very it's very hurtful advice to tell somebody that they have a hitch Right. If unless you're going to fix it for them, don't don't even say it. Right. Because so many kids just are like scared of that word because everybody's like, no, you can't do it. It's bad. So there's a lot of stigma to it. It's funny because it's like, uh, yeah, it's like complaining about something and not having a, you know, a fix to it. If you're going to complain, you better have, you know, something that or some way you can fix it. And obviously <clears throat> don't. They don't know what they're talking about. I like that you use pop there. That's Midwest and you coming out. I like that family <laughs> Midwest there. Uh, the other thing I, I was going to hit on too uh, was about uh, oh the shoebox. Okay, I'm trying to understand what was going on here. So the shoebox was on the ground, and you were told so to face. If you had an open shoebox, uh -huh. the openings facing you. You put your ball inside that shoebox, so there's a, a, a roof above your ball, right? So if you try to let that ball rise at all, you're going to hit that shoebox, right? Or put a hurdle over your ball, so you have to physically just pull it out and slide that ball. And so I always tell guys, all right, if your coach told you to do that, would you ever watch a baseball player throw a fastball like this? And they're like, no, that would be dumb. I'm like, exactly. They let their elbows bend. They let their bodies whip. They let their core pull through first. Their arm follow second. Their core pull through first. Their arms come second, right? And it's literally the same thing. You're just upside down instead of standing up. 100%. That's what it is, right? You're throwing a ball upside yeah. down. You're pitching. You're a, ba you're a baseball pitcher. You're throwing strikes. Yeah, that's yeah, and it, and also too. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that scooping motion or that not hitching makes the ball rainbow, right? I mean, they're just gonna throw it up and it's gonna yeah. come down in the, in the punter's hands. 
for, for multiple reasons. A, because you're not able to build speed because you're sh short with your motion. But the other reason too is because a lot of times you're scooping upwards at the finish, causing you to finish high and that lack of speed lets it drop. So you're getting even more effect out of that. Or you're just throwing the ball high because you're scooping it up at the finish. Whereas if you're throwing that core and then the hands, you're driving it down and through. So when that ball comes out, it should be following those hands or on the rise a little bit because you're added more speed to it. You're being more efficient and you're, you have more length and more leverage, more time to accelerate. I think that's something a lot of guys don't think about too is you have to accelerate the ball. Anytime you throw something, a discus, you're accelerating through the circle. A baseball, you're accelerating it through the throw. A lot of snappers just think, go, and they just throw it through. They don't think, how do I build speed through that movement? And that's what, that's what helps with speed, doing that acceleration from a, as long of a position as you possibly can. Absolutely. And that's a word that came up earlier, too. You're talking about length. Talk to me a little bit about length, because I know some guys like their arms bent or bent slightly or totally locked out and extended. Uh, tell me your perspective on that. So as far as the motion comes with snapping, every snapper, like we said, needs to work on that acceleration phase. And I, I like to use the example of swinging a, swinging a sledgehammer. So if I had a hammer above my head, the first movement I do is I drop that core and that builds length, okay? It builds a uh, stretch through my lats. It builds a, a longer lever here. So now I have more room to accelerate that ball through. If I just throw my hands, first of all, if I was hitting the hammer here, you'd be like, wow, you can, you're working way harder than you need to, right? Uh, so if I get that core through first, I have that length, that leverage, that acceleration. And so when it comes to snapping, as long as your ball's out in front of your head, even at least by a little bit, you have time to get that core before those hands. Okay. If that ball's under the head or your elbows are bent, no matter what you do, you can't get that head through first. So it's not that it's wrong. It's just not efficient, right? So I think a lot of snappers, uh, well, maybe not a lot of snappers, but some snappers take like offense to like, I'm like, well, hey, you're, you know, what I tell them something on Instagram and they're like, oh, well, I, I get the ball back. They're just fine. And I do it my way. That's fine. You're not wrong. Okay. But you're doing a defective job, right? But there's a difference. So if we can get them out in front of the head, it's, it makes a big difference. Now, on the other side of that, too, if I'm super extended, you're throwing your body out of position so you can't move in the right order, in the right positions, and you can be too extended, right? Just like a baseball pitcher, they have a reach, but they don't, like, reach as far as they can because at a certain point, you lose that ability to control yourself. So as a rule of thumb, do you have a general, you know, like a slight bend in your elbows, or how are you when you snap? So I like to have guys straighten their elbows uh, all the way because this is consistent and a slight bend can change from snap to snap minimally, but there's still an opportunity for, for change. So I always tell guys there's a difference between being straight and being locked. Okay. If I'm locked, I can squeeze everything and I'm really stiff and that really makes it hard to move my shoulders independently. If I'm straight and relaxed, I can have movement here and a whippy motion without being too locked in. Uh, so I, I think it's important to do that. And then as far as like, if I'm watching film, if I draw a line from the top of the snapper's head down, whether they're looking or head up, if their ball is in front of that line, I know they have decent length. Maybe they could go a little farther. Maybe they can come back a little bit. As long as they're in front of that line, it's a good tell. Yes, that's really good. And that's a really good, yeah, because I, uh, I think a lot of, uh, snappers are big on, you know, like, oh, I don't want to lock out my elbows, lock out my elbows. Well, part of that is just like you talked about, being able to move them and not totally being locked out. But, you know, I've seen a ton of long snappers who have the ball right under their head. And to me, that's, you know, horrible for their It's kind of like throwing a dart instead of really swinging that hammer, right? Not wrong, not efficient. Uh, but yeah, I think it's really important just to understand those little pieces and why they help because it makes a huge difference in your snapping and it's okay to try something new. But I think a lot of guys, they hear some advice, like they might listen to this and they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But they try it and it doesn't work for them right away. Are they gonna keep pushing? Are they gonna seek more advice? Or are they just gonna give up on it? I would say most guys that don't seek that advice and they just keep trying it on their own, end up just giving up on it if it's not working because they're like, eh, you know, I gave it a try, it didn't work. So then they tell their buddies, yeah, yeah, no, I tried, I tried that drill, it didn't work for me. Right? Like, okay, well, did you really try it or did you just kind of try it? Right? 
Right. They might not have known all the details and they just kind of went in and said, oh, I, I experimented. It wasn't for me. Exactly. Well, and you know what? I, I post a lot of videos of drills. I don't post it. I don't post all the details, right? There's got to be a little draw to come work with me. But at the same time, there's a lot of information out there that I post that it should be helpful. And I've got a lot of good feedback from kids. They're like, hey, man, I've been watching your videos. It really helped me. I'm like, sweet. Now imagine if we were to work together, how much we could do too, right? But it's awesome to hear that, you know, anything I'm doing is, is helpful out there. So, Sure. No, and I think you're doing it the right way too because, yeah, it, it definitely helps. But there is so much more they can learn from working with you with all the reasons we stated before you know so that and that's cool too and i think that's kind of why i do what i do too you know it's like we can give you bits and pieces you know but if you actually really listen to it or, or work with us you know you'll learn so much more right and i think the other side of that too is like i could put out a lot of free content but man we could be talking for hours like we've been on this call for a while now right and we we haven't even scratched the surface on drills technique you know like there's just so much out there that I can only get done if like, I know your issues, I know how to prescribe the correction and we can hammer at it. I've got guys I've worked with for years and they still haven't done all the drills, not because I'm holding them back, but because they've never had that specific issue. So I actually have guys that I've trained for a long time and now they're the snapping coaches for some camps or whatever. And I get kids that are like, Hey, I went to this camp and I did a drill that was very similar to this one but you teach it way different and I like it. I'm like, well, it's because this is where it originated. And you know, it is what it is. Uh, but it, it's all kind of a trickle down effect too, where you know, you, you learn something a certain way and it, it helps and people try to mimic it. And it maybe that isn't always the same. Sure. Sure. hundred percent. So, okay. So, you know, what you've seen working with younger guys, you know, what it, what are some things that they you know screw up on or what are some common errors that you see first day when guys come in is it you know the length or tucking the chin what do you see i think priority wise the biggest thing i notice with most guys is the imbalance grip they're like hey my ball's always pulling to my right or has a tilt or a wobble and i can't figure out why or like maybe they're, they're not like prioritizing that but when i watch their film i'm like you didn't say that you struggle with a wobble but that ball's not super flat straight and clean uh, and that's probably one of the biggest things that I battle with guys on is, hey, man, like, I know your, your other coach said that you could just be comfortable and do whatever you want and you look comfortable, but so does your snap. Like, your, your ball, it looks like you're just comfortable throwing it back there, right? Like, I want you to branch out. Like, here's your comfort zone. Let's make it, you know, let's get outside of it and make a change. And every time I've been able to help somebody balance their grip, it's been a night and day difference. So like, wow, my ball flies straighter, flatter, truer. Um, it jumps out of my hands quicker. Um, I can trust it more. So it, it's just crazy the difference. And especially they're coming from the completely opposite version of that grip too. Sure. And I've heard too, and you know, I want to know what you think about this is, you know, guys will, will like to put their, on the back side of the ball, they like to put their middle finger Yep. Or, you know, and align it with the seam or a little bit to the left or to the right of the seam. What do you yep. think about that? So using that middle finger grip is the most balanced way you can do it. Now there's other little subtle things that go in with it too. But basically with your middle finger down the seam, your index fingers create a north and south pole straight through the axis of the ball. And that's what helps create equal and opposite pressure as you fire the ball. If you go to like a split grip or an index grip, first of all, you're changing the position of the hand but you're also changing the pressure in the when that hand leaves. So with a split grip, you have a southwest pull with that index finger and all your pressure's on one hemisphere of that ball. So you change that dynamic. And if you use an index grip, your, your non-dominant hand will always leave early. So if you ever see any snappers that use an index grip, it's not wrong, but you'll always see that left hand leave first and their finish will always look like this. But if you, if you listen to other snapping coaches too, the other side of that is you have to always finish with your hands up. It's not possible if you're not balanced to start with. So if a snapper, snapper tells me, hey, I have an index grip and I can also get that balanced finish, it's because they hit and they flick out right away, like after the fact. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't affect the ball at all. So um, science tells us that this is better, but you know, a lot of guys just want to be comfortable and they just, they want to try stuff out or they, somebody tells them, hey, just do this grip, or they see somebody that's better than them using a diff different grip and it's sexier or different, so they want to try it. I like so, that, that, you, um, that you said, uh, you know, your, your flick thing there, 
because I've seen that a whole lot too with guys I've worked with in the past. How do you correct that? Or, you know, why do you guys do that? Why do they flick the ball? As far as like the, the hands coming up or just popping out? Well, coming up, but also, yeah, popping and then and bringing them out. You know what I'm saying? They fall through and then their hands come out really fast. Yeah, a lot of it comes back to body control. If they're probably not utilizing their core. If you can get your core to start the motion, it can finish the motion before everything else comes through. And that engagement allows you to stay under control, okay? If you just throw the hands through, a lot of times you're popping away or your hands aren't controlled. The biggest difference I tell guys is if I finish my hands and I'm kind of sitting away from it, they can kind of do what they want. But if I really bury myself into that finish, I have more muscles grouped together that are working in unison rather than just chucking it through. Now, on the other side of that too, like this is more comfortable. If you could chuck a ball like that all day and just feel good. But if you can control your body, it may not feel great because you actually have to control your body, but you're going to be more consistent because you know exactly the positions, the feelings, um, and the exacts of it every single time. Yes, 100%. How big is core strength? to you guys do you do a lot of core exercises mm -hmm. with your guys strength is not as much important as mobility i would much rather have a guy that can roll into a crunch than i care about how strong their abs are okay because i know the positioning it can definitely uh with better position you can definitely master that over just being strong now strength weight room you know all that is great but one thing I've also heard from other guys too is like, hey, my coach told me that I'll get a, I'm going to get more speed if I just hit the weights more. Like, it's not necess necessarily true because I've had some guys that are huge, super gym rats. They don't snap very hard because of a lot of it is how they move, right? So I have some skinny kids that snap a lot faster than my jack guys because they move more efficiently. So if you can combine those, and that's why I like to use Luke as an example because I think he's both. I think he's the gym rat, he's the technician, and we've combined it, and that's why he's so good. Uh, yeah, I don't, want you, I don't want him to be just one or the other, but I want him to know you can't just go lift weights to get fast. You can't just have technique to be the best you can be either. But we raise the technique level, you get in the gym, make yourself one monster, right? Like, do it all. That's a very valid point, too. I like that, though, the mobility point, like, especially for kickers and punters, it's not always – how freaking, how much can you power clean, you know, but it's, you know, how flexible uh, you are. And that's also for maintaining and staying injury resistant. I wonder if there's, you know, different core exercises, not really lifts, but more just, uh, you know, mobility stuff you can do Absolutely. to get more touch with that. So there is, and we do a ton of different mobility work with the thoracic spine, the core, the hips. Um, but a lot of it comes down to like, if you're mobile, you're going to be more fluid and efficient. And so going back to the weight room example of like, hey, you know, how much can you power clean or squat? Like, sure, that's great. But if you can't apply that with mobility too, it's not going to matter. And that also comes into play too with the thought of throw it hard, throw it fast, be aggressive. Okay, whenever I do that, my effort level goes up. So my technique level drops or my length drops or my control drops. Um, so we go back to what I teach is, you know, be fluid be smooth, be controlled. That's like a golf swing. I want you to just swing your golf club and let your club do the work. Don't just try to kill the golf ball. And the same effect comes into play. If I try to have a guy who is just trying to kill the ball every time or throw it as hard as they can, they might throw a good ball most of the time, but every once in a while, they're gonna have a ball that gets away from them and I guarantee they don't know why. It just happens. And those guys that don't know why that happens, struggle. And, and it's because like they get in the game and they have one off snap and they're like, well, what did I do? Let me fix something. They don't know what to fix. So they tried it. They put their butt up, they put their butt down, they changed their grip. Those things weren't the issue, right? So they're looking in, at the wrong direction to fix the issue that they had no clue they had. Um, and then there's a big slippery slope there. So I've had a lot of backups that I've been training, jump into that starting role because the starters sliding down that slope of trying to figure something out. And now, Hey, guess what? That backup is now, doing good, sticking in there, not screwing up. So they have a tough time winning that job back. And it sucks. You know, it sucks for that guy that was there. But at the same time, like, you know, if you're not always focusing on getting better, there's always somebody else that's, that's never missing the day and always pushing themselves more. 
Well, and it's about being a technician, understanding your craft too, right? So you can understand and make that change. Absolutely. So, I, and I think that's huge. And that's one thing that I need uh, all these snappers who watch this to understand is like, it's not about aggressive uh, aggressiveness. It's about a combination of, of strength, mobility, and technique. And one is not more important than the other. It's balance. It's all a balancing act. Absolutely. No, those are great points. They, I hope they are listening to that point because that you, you hit it right in the head, Cal. Absolutely. Now with, uh, you know, situational stuff, and we kind of uh, talked about it a little bit earlier. Is there anything that you do to make these guys feel like, you know, this is a game situation or how do you prepare them to, you know, because it's a whole different situation once they have pat, shoulder pads on and they're snapping in a game. How do you prepare them for that? Yeah, so a lot of it comes down to if they understand their technique, they're comfortable and they're confident with it, it's going to help a ton. But there's little things we can do. Like we, we isolate movements. Um, for example, if we're working on transitioning, a lot of guys struggle with the transitioning from the snap to the release or snap to the block because they're trying to be aggressive, quick, hard. And you may know this from uh, personal experience, but a lot of special teams coordinators, if they're looking for somebody to block, they're like, get your eyes up, go faster, 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 faster. And now in my mind, that's the last thing I want that snapper to do is just think about being faster and more aggressive and just going as quick as they can because then I know they're short in their snap, they're not being smooth and fluid and everything like that, right? But as a coach, you're like, but I want them to go faster. Yes, but if you have them work on it and think about it a different way, they will be faster and they'll be more controlled. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there where like, okay, yes, speed, we want that, but also we have... We need things to go the right way, the right order, the right control. Uh, but, you know, the transition piece, we isolate things. We, we change up um, looking or not looking because, you know, sometimes that, that's a big indicator for when they're going to snap or just finding a comfort level, which I think a lot of guys are, are very set on. You have to look. You have to not look. It doesn't really matter. Your head's either up or it's down. Like, nobody cares. Um, you're still going to do the same thing. You're either throwing your head or your chin's stuck. Um, the only time it's really important is if you got to catch a hand signal or something from the, the shield, right? Uh, otherwise, I could care less what they do. Um, you feel that uh, – I know a lot of younger guys will do a no look, and it seems to be that way they can really get that feeling of tucking that chin and, and snapping. Yeah. What's your opinion? Because I know that's a huge discussion. Look, no look. Uh, how do you feel about that? So, like I said, I, I don't have a preference. They can do whatever they want. I know that a lot of times kids will have a better – understanding or a better awareness of disassociation, meaning they can throw their head and use their core and then use their arms better if they throw their head. But if their chin's tucked, a lot of guys will just set, like seize up and move everything together. So even my, my NFL guys, a lot of them look because it's a little less movement. It's a little more uh, controlled in their mind. So they, they look back there, but then they have, sometimes they have a tough time with that whipping motion or just relaxing those shoulders and lats for that split second. So if they can do it, no big deal. But it does, the no look does help with that disassociation or that disengagement of, hey, my head moves different than my chest or my lats and my arms, right? So um, accuracy wise though, uh, I know there's guys that will say, you look snap, you're gonna be more accurate. It's not necessarily true. Uh, and the one example I always use is the Michael Jordan closing his eyes and shooting a free throw just to make fun of somebody, right? How is he able to do that? He wasn't looking at his target. He was able to do that because he knows what his body has to do every single time. He knows what it has to feel like. He has exact feelings. He's got exact landmarks. He just lets it happen. Why think about it if you know all the, all the exacts, right? So as a snapper, you head up, your head down, you should be able to close your eyes and hit the same snap because you know what your finish feels like. You know what your process feels like. Do you ever have guys work that where they close their eyes and snap? Absolutely. And just work That's exactly, absolutely a drill that we do. It's called a blind snap. And if they can do that, it's not necessarily about just closing the eyes and ripping the ball, but it's about having a conversation. Where'd you think that ball went? Okay, I it went a little bit left and high. Why'd you think it did that? Well, my right hand flicked a little bit harder, I think, or my, I felt like my body turned a little bit. So it's less about the result, more about, hey, what did it feel like? What was your awareness? Man. A little bit of Yoda stuff. Yeah, man, that's, that's really good because it's just, it's so body awareness. And I think it's different from, you know, um, with, special, or with normally kickers and punters, it's more about um, calming their mind, you know, 
which I'm sure is important for long snappers too, but body awareness is, is just as important and it shows with all the stuff you guys are doing. Right. And well, and so I truly believe in everything we teach. And I think that um, if, if some kickers were able to kind of dig into as much detail as, as we dig into, I think it would be a, a game changer too. Like, it's just, you know, who wants to dig into it? Who's not afraid to like screw up and, and learn and, you know, I think that's going to, that's going to take that position maybe to another level too, as far as like, Hey, let's, let's figure out not a new way to do it, but how to explain it better. Right. Yes. Cause I, even like just from being around kicking coaches, like there's, you know, you fit your foot up a certain way and you plant foot goes here and you just you kick it, go kick it. Right. Like I think that there's, I've seen a lot of that. And even like I've, I've asked some guys like, hey, just teach me how to kick. Like if you can teach me how to do it, I can't kick a ball then you must be a pretty good coach, right? Um, so I, I think it's a completely different thing, but at the same time, like I think there's definitely ties, right? Well, and what you do in the, I think which one thing you do really well just from talking with you here today is that you give good, um, you know, euphemisms and also, you know, showing it through different sports. And I think that really helps stick with a person is seeing it in a different way. So that's right. huge. Well, then trying it themselves is completely different too. Like I have a, a snapper right now who is one of the top rated high school guys in the country and he's struggling. Like I said, Hey, this is what we're going to do. Here's some drills to work on. And he was like, but how, but why, you know, like, I'm like, great. Ask these questions. Let's figure it out. And, and he's learning and he's changing. And he just sent me some film and it was like night and day difference. He's like, these felt weird. And I watched the film and I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Keep doing that. He's like, all right, I, I can see it a little bit. And his dad like chimed in. He's like, "Hey, he's killing it right now. These are awesome." Like, so it, it's just cool to see. Like, as the as the snapper, sometimes it, you're like, kind of screen as far as like, it's hard to tell. Are you really getting better? It's, it feels weird. Does it look better? But as somebody catching it, if you're the dad like helping out, you're like, "Damn, these balls are faster," and you're not missing super high anymore. Or, you know, it's it's fun to see that. Oh, 100 percent. That's the best feeling, right? As a coach, you can get is like when someone has that like oh crap moment you know when it's like wow yeah. I'm, I'm made light bulb huge. Huge. yeah that light bulb moment that's what you that's your buzzword that's pretty good uh, now and we we kind of brushed up against it i want you to talk to me a little bit about i'm i'm a big guy on uh, visualization yeah you know, i always have my specialist um i got this from shane graham but give them you know a picture of the stadium night before a game and have them look at it and visually see themselves perform and go through different situations where it's the fourth quarter, it's 2.45 left and the score is this and this. You know, what type of mental process do you take your guys through, uh, you know, and, and how do you prepare them that way? You know, I, I think that's definitely a great way to do it. And, and that's something I use personally, uh, walking the field before a game and just thinking about, hey, if I'm here, this is the kind of uh, – position I put myself as far as if the returner's here, if he's not, um, if I get to snap a ball that's backed up, nothing's different. Don't think about anything different. So you put yourself in that spot, maybe just snap a couple just to prove to yourself, like still the same snap. Like I don't have to change anything. Um, but a, a big thing that I, I'm really big on it in the mental side of it is I really love this book. Uh, it's called the inner game of tennis. Have you read it? I haven't. No. Okay. So it's about tennis. The forward is by Pete Carroll. Um, and it's just very, uh, it's got a lot of ties, like as to a specialist, like you can just read this and you're like, you're reading about tennis and you're like, that would make a lot of sense if I apply that to my specialty right here. Uh, so I've had a lot of guys take that and a lot of it's just like, um, how to just kind of take a step back and, and be more of, a, of an observer rather than being super judgmental. Cause it's super easy as a specialist to be like, man, that snap sucked, that kick sucked instead of being like, just stepping back and be like, okay, it wasn't good, but here's why. And being able to just observe more than judge. Cause I think once you get in that judging mode, it's easy to get pissed off. It's easy to make decisions that maybe aren't the best. Uh, and so it really just digs into a lot of different aspects that I think are important. But I would say, I don't focus as much on like the situational stuff as I do the technique and just some, some minor mental game parts of it, just because I feel like there's just so much technique stuff I could do. And there's so little time that I'm like, oh, let's hit that up. Cause I know in the long run, if they can make their technique better, they can learn from experience and you get in a game for the first time, you get those, those nerves out. Sometimes it just takes over. And a lot of times 
you can get overcoached in this, in the fact that like learning from experience is so invaluable that if you're getting all this information from somebody who's got all this great information, you're thinking about all these things that you could be doing or should be doing instead of just living in the moment, right? Let yourself be nervous. What's wrong with that? You know, but at the end of the day, like soak it in, have that wow factor, be starstruck when you're in the NFL locker room for the first time. And then understand that, Hey, you're there for a reason. You know what you got to do. You know that you're good enough to be there and just let your body take over. I think that's so important. I think that, that you're saying, let yourself be nervous. That is, it's, you know, you scan your body and feel yourself being nervous. That's you getting ready to go compete. You right. already know all that preparation that you've done and all those hours you put in. Now you're finally ready to go perform. That's your body fight. You know, your body's fight. And fight. That's, that's part of the fun of the game is those butterflies, right? Like if you didn't get butterflies, you're not playing, right? You're like, why are you playing in the first place? Right? So I think part of it, it's just letting it happen. Um, and then like, for example, like my first pro game, I got out there and I was super nervous. Like I felt like everything was slow motion. I had butterflies. I was going to throw up and I was able to use like some breathing techniques to help me out. But I also think, you know, we talked about this earlier, using breathing techniques are, are great. But if you don't understand like everything you're doing or how to correct things on the fly or, you know, like the technique side of it, breathing just to calm yourself down, just to like throw something back there with no technique or no understanding is only going to help so much anyway. Right. So I think there needs to be, yes, there's a mental side. Yes. There's a technique side. And you got to have both really, if you want to take it to the next level and, and be at your peak performance, uh, because, you know, breathing techniques, like I would take three deep breaths, every deep breath, I could just feel my body relax. And now boom, I'm focused. I'm in the game or I'm blocking everything out or whatever it is that helps you get in the right mindset. And it could be different for everybody, you know, different people, right? You know, a lot of guys to, uh, you know, I'm in, with specialists in general, kickers, punters, but, you know, also I'm sure long snappers, uh, you know, aim small, miss small is yep. a common saying, you know, do you have something that you tell your guys for their aiming points on a punter's body? I love the saying, uh, but there's a lot of that goes into it that I think a lot of guys lack. So like when, when somebody says aim small, miss small, they mean, oh yeah, look at the punter's hip or look at a little logo on his hip, right? And then what? then what are you doing, right? What are you doing with your body after that aspect? So I'll get a lot of guys where I'm like, I put a ball on the tee, I'm like, hit it. I don't know, aim small, miss small, right? Like you're aiming at something small, you shouldn't miss it. Or like, I, obviously, you know, there's room for error, but they, they try, they're like, hey, this is hard. And then I'm like, all right, now do these certain things with your body, control your body more, be more efficient. And all of a sudden that becomes easier. So the sen sentiment of aim small, miss small is, is, is awesome. But also if you know what goes into that process, it makes that so much easier. Now you can just relax and trust that rather than just look at the target, right? Every basketball player is taught when they're shooting a free throw to look at the front of the rim. You stare at that, you'll make a free throw. But that doesn't make everybody equally good. Shaq isn't as good as, you know, I'm not a basketball fan by any means, but like, you know, whatever. It's two different basketball players, they're not equal just because they look at the same thing. And that's coming back around to look snapper, no look snapper. Does it really matter what you look like or look at if you're doing the same thing with your body every single snap. So yeah, sure. There's, there's probably comfort level mental side that goes into each pick, whatever makes you feel better and do better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've hit on a ton of great stuff here, Kyle. And we're starting to wind down here, but I do have some good questions uh, still coming up here for you. Sure. You know, with kickers and punters, it's big for them to have like rep counts, you know, and, yeah my question for you is do long snappers do you give them a rep count and how do you keep a long snapper's body fresh throughout the the whole long grind of a season yeah i think a rep count comes more for guys that are more experienced probably college or nfl guys a little bit more than high school guys um typically high school guys play another position they're never really going to reach the rep count especially at practice you know um, when they're on their own, they're snapping on their own, then absolutely they're, they're going to be able to oversnap pretty quickly. So I would say about 30 to 40 snaps in the session um, for a typical long snapper is a, a pretty good amount. Like that's when I would say, hey, that's pretty good. Because I believe if you're focused on technique and you're focused on specific drills and you're focused on absolutely trying to make something better, what do you need to take 100 snaps for anyway? Right? So if you're out there just ripping the ball to rip the ball, you're not improving. 
right? If you, if you have something, if you're an effective snapper and you're just snapping to get reps because reps make you better, then, then, you know, there's nothing really tangible that you're focused on. Like, are you working on being balanced? Are you working on being efficient? Are you working on being controlled? I, I would say most snappers, most, especially most high school guys are like, my coach told me if I just practice, I'll get better. In a way that's true. Like, yeah, you're going to get experience. You're probably going to learn from experience and you're going to feel things out as you go, but why not focus on something more deliberately, right? So anytime I get a, a new client and they send me film for the first time, a lot of times it's not as precise. It's not as deliberate as I would like it to be. So we have a talk about, hey man, you were snapping, but were you really focused on what you should have been, right? Don't, don't send me 10 snaps at the end of your session when I know you didn't perfect what we already talked about. Because what's that doing for you? If we're trying to change something and then you just go rip 10 snaps and it's not applied, you're just building habits that aren't necessary or aren't wanted. Do you ask them what they were focused on here or what their goal was? If they send me film and they didn't tell me what their focus was, I'll just ask them before I even break it down. Because if, if I know what they were thinking about, it helps me kind of get in their, their mindset. It's like, okay, you were focused on your grip. Okay, that's why your legs didn't really activate the same way. Or you, that's why maybe your core or whatever, the, you know, something fell apart because you were focused on the, that one thing. And that's okay. Because we, we got to play whack-a-mole. We're working on the hands. We're working on the core. Then we're working on the feet and the hips. When you focus on one, something else falls apart. And we just keep correcting until everything falls in line. Yeah, that's huge. And that's I think that's the right way to go about it. Even, again, you know, we draw the parallels from kicking and, and long snapping, but that is a great way to start. It's like, okay, what were you focused on? If you can't tell me, you know, you were just kind of out there kicking balls. Yeah. And yeah, what were you getting better at, right? It's absolutely. Absolutely. Now with, um, you've seen a lot of guys that have played at the highest level, you know, how do they handle bad? What's the best way you've seen them handle bad days? And what's the way that you've seen guys that, you know, uh, didn't really handle those bad days well. What's the best and worst of those situations? Yeah, I, it absolutely depends on from position or uh, athlete to athlete and, and level for sure. Uh, you know, guys at the highest level, it, I've seen it at like our pro camp that we do. I've seen it at the NFL level. The, the best guys are guys that they throw a ball that maybe wasn't their best ball. They're like, whatever. I've learned from it. I know how to correct it. It's done. The guys that are, are probably worse off in that situation they have a bad snap and instead of like just learning from it moving on they're going to hyper focus on that one thing and they're just going to drive and dig and pick at it pick at it and maybe they're on the right path and maybe they're not you know and if they're not like like we said earlier if they're thinking hey i had a wobbly snap i'm going to lower my hips or i'm going to like they change something that's completely unrelated now they've just screwed with everything and that's where i've seen guys struggle the most is they think they know what to fix but they have no clue the direction they need to take. So actually, for example, I get a lot of kids, they come to me, our first session, I'm like, hey, so what do you think your main issue is? And they're like, I need to lock my legs out harder. That's, and I'm like, that sounds like a solution. What's your issue? And they're like, I, I just got to lock my legs out harder. I'm like, are you sure? Like, why don't you let me tell you what your issue, or like how to fix the issue? Let's talk about what are you seeing? Why do you think you need that? Right, what is the why? Right, exactly. And, and so I think so many guys, they're just like, they either they went to a big camp or they had some other coach or they're just watching YouTube. They're like, these other guys, they said this or I saw this. That's, that's the fix. I need that fix. Why do you need that fix? Are you sure you need that fix? Could be something completely unrelated, right? So that's big. That is big. That's, and that's funny that you say that because that does sound like a, a typical young guy, you know, answer. He's just trying to figure it out, you know. And it, again, good intentions. Yeah. And, um, you know, they might not really know what they're really aiming for there. Okay. I don't mean to put you on the spot now, but if you have one of your favorite drills that you've made and that you think it really stresses the fundamentals for, uh, you know, a young guy, what is one or two uh, drills that you would work on with, uh, you know, a general long snapper is just starting out? Yep. Uh, I love the isolated drills that we do. Uh, one drill that comes to mind is it's called a whip drill and it's something that any snapper can do it's not going to make sense if you're not working towards an efficient movement but if you are if you have a general idea at the very least it's really going to help so um actually i can pull up a clip of film so i don't have to demo it yeah go ahead 
So let's see here. Okay. So ready when you are. Go ahead. All right. So this is called a whip drill. And basically the tools you need for this is a t-shirt and something to hit. So what we're working on here is, is watching the snapper whip his body through his motion and crack that whip. If he's fluid, if he's efficient with his movement, not only is it going to look crisp and clean and efficient, but he's going to be getting in the exact positions we're looking for. His core is pulling through first. His arms are following. His arms are chopping down and through. And then he sticks that finish at the end. Now, you can't hear this because we're muted here on the video, but it's a listening drill. If you can hear that shirt crack against whatever it is, a PVC, a pad, uh, a wall, it could be drywall, right? Could be a chair. If you can hear that, that crack, you're probably doing a good job of whipping and sticking. If it sounds kind of soft or thuddy, you're probably shoving through or not controlling your body as much, or maybe you were short with the start. So it's really important that we put it all together here and we're working on that acceleration. So you can see that once he gets here, he's now accelerating down and through while controlling his body. So this one's a super easy one to do wherever you can. Uh, and it's really important just to, it gives you that feeling. It gets a football out of your hands. So you're not worried about the product. You're worried about your body and the process. And it just makes things happen for you. So now if you do it without an understanding of exactly what we're looking for, it can be tough, but it makes a big difference in body control, efficiency, balance, right? If you, you can't be unbalanced and really crack that whip at the finish and stay control. Yeah, absolutely. And it hits on all three of those, you know, things that you talked about before. And I, I think from what I've seen personally is, is yeah, that balance and that, you know, being efficient with your movements is something that young guys definitely struggle with a lot. So. Well, I think one thing that we see too is like, uh, if for, for in your position, um, you're going to get guys that are, have been snapping for a certain way for a long time. You're in your position. You're not going to be able to really just change them. Right. And I see that even at the NFL level, like a, a team will pick up one of my guys and their coach wants to change look snap, no look snap. They want to change how they hold the ball, how they throw it, how they, you know, like pick up a guy you like, you know, if, if you like a certain style or you agree with something specific, go get a guy that does that. Like it's, it's almost worse off to find an athlete and try to break him down with the lack of time and resources sometimes, and then expect him to excel. So I, I've seen that a lot and it, it sucks for those guys. Cause then, I've had a guy before that he went to a big college, was like the walk-on of the year. New staff came in, said, you suck. We want somebody different. We want you to do it different. He transferred out. Same kind of thing at a new school. I thought he was killing it. Um, this coach didn't like it, didn't like the scheme or like the, the technique or whatever. And he ended up just quitting. He's like, it's not worth it. So. That's really sad too, you know, because, yeah, and that's something I realized – I think we realize as guys I've worked with specialists, it's like, I tell my guys all the time, look, you know, I had a guy that wanted to change his steps, you know, all out, you know, kickoff steps. And it's like, we're not making this huge change week two of the season or week, you know, in fall camp. You do that in the springtime when you have time to, you know, work on breaking it down and really working your technique. Uh, but a lot of coaches don't understand that. They want this right now and they wanted 100 percent of the balls to be right on his hip right on the yeah. punter's hip and it's like it's not going to happen like that well and i had an experience too where i was pursuing college coaching for a while and i was a specialist coach here at the d3 school in town and we got these specialists in and i was like they're gonna do all these drills every day and i'm gonna make them better and then it came down to i learned that hey when i was making them focus on certain things and changing things they weren't performing the way they could and they were they were good enough already you know like uh, but they weren't, in my mind, as good as they could be. So yeah, I was pushing them harder, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So I, I learned that, like, hey, man, like, as with the amount of time that a college coach has in practice, you can't get it done. Like, especially you got a couple weeks before your first game. Like, do it in the off season. Now I do have guys that have a membership throughout the season. We're not changing stuff during season, though. We're not introducing anything new. It's like, hey. Here's what we've worked on. Here's what's been working for you and we've been excelling at. Here's a, maybe here's a new drill to focus on the same thing. You know, here's something you could do to not slip on what, what's been working, right? So which is a completely different thing um, rather than 
hey, here's some new techniques. Here's something new to think about. Go out there and make it perfect and do really well and, you know, impress your coaches at the same time, right? So I think it's that young coach in, in everybody that just wants to be the best. Sure, sure. But and I think what you just stated is what I call refining. You know, during the season, let's refine, refine and let's get, you know, uh, just maintain and make sure we're still getting a little bit better without changing a whole lot of stuff. That's fine. And that's, you Absolutely. know, sometimes less is more. And I'm definitely realizing that in my experiences. Yeah. And just to piggyback off that off seasons for reinventing in seasons for refining, right? Sure. The two R's of snapping and kicking and punting, there's got two different seasons for it, but you can always be working, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are awesome points. And now is there, uh, you know, we're about to wrap up here, but, First of all, Kyle, those have been some fantastic points, man. I really do appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your wealth of knowledge uh, with us. Is there a success quote or a motivational quote that you like? I know you like to read there um, that, uh, you know, really sticks with you and, and you really enjoy. Man, that is, that's putting me on the spot, man. Like there's a, there's a ton of good quotes and everything out there that, that people live by. Um, and I'm not sure I have one off the top of my head. Uh, I, I, I'm always living by the balance, efficiency, and control thing that we talked about as far as that goes. Uh, but actually, one that comes to my mind right now is uh, work until your rivals uh, – work until your idols become your rivals. It was one of my favorites. And that, that's one that I kind of held close to me when I was pursuing the, the pro level is – I, when I went to my first pro camp, all these guys were like above me. I was starstruck. They're like, they, I've seen them on YouTube, right? And then when I was competing with them and they're like, I was up there with them and then I was rated above them at some point. That was my, my kind of moment where I was like, all right, these guys that I was competing against, they were my idols. Now they're my rivals. I'm on the same playing field as them. And that was so cool for me um, just to realize that. So, you know, I think that's something if, if, if guys can live by that and just – try to dream and, and build their way up every single day that they're training, you know, eventually they're going to reach that same effect. Absolutely. Man, that's, and what a great feeling that must be too, Honda. Huh? To finally, you know, make it or, or at least be competing with them. That's how I feel, you know, in the coaching world. It's like, man, I've heard about all these guys and now to be working with them or coaching against them or even making contact with them is, is a phenomenal feeling. So that's really well, that's cool. Any industry, you know, whether it's football or not, like you're going to have people in whatever industry you're in that are above you. Work your butt off until you're at that level, right? I think, you know, a lot of people are just cool just being where they're at. That For me, it takes a different personality to like be extremely motivated and never be happy with where you're at, you know. Uh, but if you can make that happen, you're going to go really far. And learn what you, you know, take what you learn from being a specialist and, and playing at a high level and apply it to your, your life after sports. You know, that's, that's a huge thing that, you know, football brings for everybody. You know, it's, it's not just a game. It's an it's a opportunity to not only improve your, yourself mentally and physically, but emotionally um, make connections and, and just build your, build your life afterwards. Well, I see that you still have that competitive edge, that competitive fire in you from your playing days. So that's awesome to see you go. Absolutely. Man, well, this has been fantastic. One of the best talks I've ever heard on snapping, um, you know, if, guys want to reach out to you there because they're definitely going to be surefire interested in special teams you uh, and I'm sure they've already seen you out and about where can they reach you at so I need my social media accounts work uh, I'm big on Instagram and Twitter um, it's always at special teams you um, they can always email and at coach stelter at gmail.com um, or just find my website special teams you.com awesome awesome Kyle well we appreciate it, you guys. You've heard the links. You've heard um, all the fantastic coaching points, man. Uh, so happy you could come on and do this. Let's do this again sometime real soon. Absolutely. It's been great, man. I really appreciate you having me. Um, and, and, and good luck with everything this year, all right? I appreciate that, man. Hey, we'll be in touch. And uh, thanks for being on. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions you'd like asked or select yes coming up, follow and send us a message on Twitter and Instagram to Iceman underscore kicking or IcemanKicking at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us and turn notifications on YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud at Iceman Kicking Podcast and rate and review us on Apple Music. This will be important 
as we will have giveaways going forward. Also, check out our TikTok under the same name for the best clips from these interviews. And tune in next week for another great special teams mind. I'm Brett Arkellian, and for everyone at the Iceman Kicking Podcast, we hope you stay cool under pressure. Have a great week.